as we get to the latest on the situation unfolding there. President Biden says the U.S. will not support an Israeli strike on Iran's nuclear sites in retaliation for this week's major attack. Over the course of an hour Tuesday, Iran launched 181 ballistic missiles at Israel, believed to be the largest ballistic missile attack ever. Israel's prime minister threatened retaliation, saying Iran, quote, made a big mistake firing a barrage of about 180 missiles at Israel and, quote, will pay for their actions. At the same time, Iran's U.S. ambassador warned Israel that its response to any acts of aggression against Iran, quote, will be swift, decisive, and stronger than before, as Iran calls Tuesday's attack an act of self-defense. A lot here to discuss, so I do want to bring in Ali Reza Jafarzadeh, the executive director of the Washington office of the National Council of Resistance of Iran, also the author of The Iran Threat. Thank you so much for taking the time, as always, to be here with us today. The truth is, behind closed doors, the P word became my secret sin at age 10. And for the next us today. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, always a pleasure to be on your show. All right, so first off, my big question here, and this is kind of a big one. What is Iran's endgame overall? You have this major attack, the largest ballistic, uh, ballistic missile attack really ever. What is the endgame? Well, as far as the Ayatollahs ruling Iran are concerned, they just basically want to stay in power because they are in deep trouble. Uh, what you've seen over the past few months is a, actually a projection of power by the Iran regime to make the world believe that the Ayatollahs are 10 feet tall, they have all the power, they have all the proxies. It's all done to cover a, a, a very deep-rooted uh, weakness inside the country. The regime is facing a, a discontented uh, population that has called for change. Um, the regime is engulfed in corruption. And, um, and that's why they, you know, they're relying on the proxy forces, whether it's in Lebanon, in Syria, uh, in Iraq, in you, you name it, the whole region. That's the strategy of survival. Remember, in the backdrop of that, there were uh, nine rounds of major uprisings in Iran since 2018, uh, when people in all 31 provinces of Iran uh, protested against the regime, calling for change, and um, the regime had to resort to sheer violence and executions and killing people on the spot, arresting them and jailing them in order to temporarily uh, put down the revolt. And the concern of the Ayatollahs is that there is going to be another uh, restart, uh, re-emergence of the uprisings, and they may not survive the next round. That's why they're heavily relying on these proxies. That's why you see all these missiles being fired and, you know, left and right. Um, this is all just designed for that purpose, and I hope the world understands the vulnerability of the regime in the midst of all of these attacks. And what I did want to ask you overall is we talk about the assassination of Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah. Does that really mean anything to Iran overall? Do they care that much or is it more of an excuse, I guess, to launch this kind of attack against Israel? Is it kind of in the middle somewhere? Well, you know, remember the, uh, what's really happening in the region is, is a clear indication that the head of the snake of war and terror lies in Tehran. And, and that's why uh, when, you know, when the regime uh, or its proxies are uh, receiving blows, that's serious uh, for them. The elimination of uh, Hassan Nasrallah was clearly a major blow to the Supreme Leader uh, Khamenei uh, and the regime as a whole. It was also the, you know, the fate of uh, Nasrallah is also uh, a reminder and a proof um, that, um, you know, the uh, biggest uh, grand loser, strategic loser of the developments in the region is the is Khamenei and the regime in Tehran. They are the ones who have been behind much of the terror and, and warmongering in the region, and they're paying the price for it. Uh, Hezbollah, of course, uh, among all the other proxies, has played a key role for Tehran. Uh, it's not even comparable to any other groups in the region. It's entirely relying on the regime in Tehran, both
both in terms of training, finances, and, you know, over three, four decades. And um, they did uh, most of the uh, dirty work on behalf of the old sports of the Revolutionary Guards. Look at Syria. Um, Hezbollah played a key role on behalf of Tehran to keep the uh, Syrian dictator Assad in power. Look at the situation of the Houthis in Yemen. Uh, that um, a lot of the trainings that the Houthis are getting, they get it actually in Lebanon um, by the Hezbollah on behalf of, uh, of Tehran. So when Hassan Nasrallah, who says we get everything from Tehran, he says, well, he said when we have, when Iran has money, we have money. He said that even the clothes that they had on, in addition to everything else, the equipment and training, all come from Tehran. So when the regime receives, when Hassan Nasrallah is eliminated, that's a big blow, blow to the Iran regime. And of course, they have to save face. They have to, you know, to do something to show to their own forces that they are not under, you know, constant barrage of attacks. They make acts here and there, which actually comes from the nature of the regime. Uh, but none of them are going to really save this regime. My last question for you here, I want to talk about the nuclear threat from Iran overall, because we've seen their, I don't know if you would say stockpile, but their resources, the threat overall kind of rising over the past several months. What do you make of that? Is that a threat to the U.S., to Israel, to other countries across the world? Well, the nuclear weapons program of the Iran regime, um, in parallel to their support for terrorism is actually part and parcel of the strategy of the regime to survive. Their survival strategy is two pillars, repression inside the country, export of terror, development of nuclear weapons and missile program abroad. That program, unfortunately, has advanced uh, over the past two decades. You know, we were the ones who first exposed the, the nuclear sites in August of 2002 that triggered for the first time the inspections of Iranian nuclear sites uh, by the International Atomic Energy Agency see the IAEA, but unfortunately the outside world, instead of holding the regime accountable, instead of um, trying to prevent the expansion of the program, which was in the very basic steps in 2002, uh, they just gave concessions to the Iran regime, they legitimized the Iran regime's uh, uh, program, they allowed them to expand the, and allowed them to, uh, you know, basically kick out inspectors uh, and making some sites off limits. It's gotten to a point um, that, uh, you know, this has become a, a serious threat there. They have uh, near weapons grade enriched uranium. They have a, a ex advanced weaponization part of the program that has basically been off limits. And that's why I think uh, the real solution to end both the threat of terrorism and the threat of the nuclear weapons or the missile or drone program of the Iran regime is basically to focus on the head of the state, which is regime change by the people of Iran and it's you know and it's very doable because as I said there is a you know discontent population but on top of that there is there is an organized opposition there is an alternative uh, to this regime that has been fighting the Ayatollahs for years that have been undermining it that's the main preoccupation of the uh, Iran regime the, the regime can survive pressure they can survive sanctions uh, but what they cannot survive is their own population and they want the outside world not to look at that direction and that's why I think it's so important for the United States for Europe for all the Western nations and the countries uh, to uh, craft a new policy regarding Iran that the central element of that policy would be accountability for the Iran regime, but also uh, supporting the uh, uh, regime change by the people of Iran, as we have seen in, in the protests all over the country in the past. That's what you really need to do. You need to think about the solution, a long-term solution that would eliminate the root cause of all of these terrorism or the threat of the Iran regime, and that's regime change by the people of Iran. And, you know, it doesn't 
matter what the regime does, you know, they get a new president just came to New York uh, last week, um, preaching to the world about peace. Uh, but there were thousands of um, Iranian Americans who were there, making it very clear to the world and to the regime and whoever was there that this regime doesn't represent the people of Iran. That regime change by the people of Iran is the solution, and that there is an alternative with a clear platform uh, known as the Ten Point Plan. Uh, introduced by a female leader, Mrs. Mariam Rajavi, that calls for uh, you know separation of religion and state ballot box as the only criteria uh, for legitimacy, gender equality, freedom of religion, free market economy, peace in the Middle East, and a non-nuclear republic Iran. This is the platform that has the support of a majority of the members in the U.S. Congress, in addition to some additional 4,000 parliamentarians around the world. That's where the administration, whether the current or the future administrations, will have to focus. Listen to the elected representatives of their own uh, parliaments um, and, and, and draft a, a, a totally new policy regarding Iran. All right. Ali Reza, thank you so much for taking the time.